speaking of the mark of the beast, we're going to go into the next part of the news, which is going to be discussing a, a, a few uh, parts of um, some information that's come out on the mark of the beast. And um, I actually want to play a audio clip and a sound bite of the former director of Project Blue Beam. Project Blue Beam is a is a uh, a sector of DARPA, and this woman's name is Regina Dugan. All right, and she is basically sitting on a show talking to a couple of men about this electronic tattoo that she had, you know, sketched in her left arm. So I want to play this so that you can hear how close we are to them implementing this mark of the beast. Notice how this comes right at the time when Obamacare is starting to take flight and pick up steam as far as being um, imposed mandatorily on the American public. All right, so we're going to play this, uh, this come back. We're going to discuss a little bit of it and go into some news articles on uh, some of this Mark of the Beast technology and, uh, and further information of how close they are to uh, bringing this all to pass. Like one of them is the mechanical mismatch between humans and electronics, right? So electronics are boxy and rigid, humans are curvy and soft. That's a mechanical mismatch problem. Well, a researcher at the University of Illinois, his name is Dr. Rogers, what he discovered is that he could use standard CMOS techniques to make islands of high-performance silicon connected by accordion-like structures that would allow it to stretch up to 200% and still be performing. And what he did is he founded a company and they started making electronic tattoos. So I, I'm wearing one here on my arm. Can we, do we have here. a camera to get a... This is a, devel this is a developmental system made by MC10, and it has uh, an antenna and some sensors embedded in it. And what we plan to do is work with them to advance a tattoo that could be used for authentication. Now, it may be true that 10 to 20 year olds don't want to wear a watch on their wrist, but you can be sure that they'll be far more interested in wearing an electronic tattoo if only to piss off their parents, <laughs> right? And that can have a design, right? Because sure. they would certainly want some kind of cool design. Options, right? options. And that's something that you wear, but you could also imagine including authentication in just your daily habit. So I take a vitamin every morning. What if I could take vitamin authentication? What? Vitamin authentication. Look, I have one right here. Well, here, I'll let you hold it. Mm. Would you like to hold it? I'll hold it. Okay. <laughs> so this... You guys see it? This pill has a small chip inside of it with a switch. It also has what amounts to an inside-out potato battery. When you swallow it, the acids in your stomach serve as the electrolyte. That's what they do. And they power it up, and the switch goes on and off. And it creates an 18-bit ECG-like signal in your body, and essentially your entire body becomes your authentication token. Yes, this is true. Okay. Okay, but. Okay, so wait. But so it's uh, it's really true. So what this means is that that becomes my first superpower. I really want the superpower. It means that my arms are like wires, my hands are like alligator clips. When I touch my phone, my computer, my door, my car, I'm authenticated in. First superpower. Like I want that. So so we're not shipping that right away. Yeah. No. <laughs> we're not shipping that right but, away. But it but sounds is it, like is it, this is FDA clear. So here's the thing. This. This is not science fiction. This pill is actually made by a company called Proteus, and they've developed it for medical applications. That pill has been CE stamped and cleared by the FDA. You can take 30 of those per day for the rest of your life. And then what happens? Does your heart Nothing. beat change? Does your <laughs> we can just tell that you've taken the pill. I mean, the medical, app yeah. the medical application... Does Google now know everything I do? The world is on the verge of global change. The speed of data transmission has increased by multiples of millions. The rate of globally significant events and that of discoveries and crises 
is growing exponentially. Our civilization is like an uncaptained ship sailing on rough seas with neither chart nor compass, all the while moving faster and faster. The time we have to make the right decisions is shorter and shorter. We are facing the choice to fall into a new dark age, into affliction and degradation, or to find a new model for human development and create not simply a new civilization, but a new mankind. Historic crises show that to break the deadlock, we need technological revolution. It is clear that today's revolution will also require the deepest social transformation. The world's community and leaders should encourage mankind instead of wasting resources on solving momentary problems. To focus on the technologies of the future, nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, cognitive technology, genetics and robotics. Doing so will allow us to find new sources of energy, create fundamentally new architecture and transportation, allow unprecedented developments of human cognitive abilities, refine artificial intelligences and brain-computer interfaces, simulate complex systems, create humanoid robots and cyborgs, and with the help of nanorobots, we may develop manageable matter. Find ways to transfer one's personality to an artificial carrier. Yet what we need is not just another technological revolution, but a new civilizational paradigm. We need new philosophy and ideology, new ethics, new culture and new psychology, and even new metaphysics. We must reset our limits, go beyond ourselves, beyond the Earth and beyond the solar system. This is an adequate response to the challenges of our time. Thus, new reality and future man will arise. Could it happen spontaneously? clips when I touch my phone, my computer, my door, my car, I'm authenticated in. First superpower. Like, I want that. But, you know, the, the, the whole move of these implants, there are a couple of stupid companies like the Verichip Corporation, with all its various names, that come out and say, oh, well, we want to sell this as a product. I don't think it's going to happen that way. People don't want an ID microchip. But if you turn around and instead say, you'll be able to listen to music and access Facebook and, and, and uh, you know, get your email through this little implant, you're going to have a stampede of people wanting to do it. Because we... All right, so that was a uh, a clip, audio clip from a video that you can actually go on YouTube and check it out. I, I suggest everybody go on and check it out. It's called uh, 666 uh, Mark of the Beast Superpowers. And so let's talk about some of the things that were said. You had, the, again, the, the, the woman that was talking at the beginning, his name was uh, Regina uh, Dugan. She's the uh, director of uh, Project Bluebeam. Uh, sector of DARPA, and she now is uh, like under one of the main guys at Google as a director at Google now. And um, again, you know, when it comes to Google, Google's whole objective is to uh, gather as much information about you as possible. Everything you do, you search, you go here, you go there. Google's collecting and storing all of that information. Um, now, she, uh, working for Google, now you can see she came on and started talking about an electronic tattoo. So now you're seeing an electronic tattoo being offered through Google. Uh, we talked about Google Glass before, um, and now they're talking about this new electronic tattoo. And the way that they're trying to get people to accept and embrace this is making it cool. You know, oh, you can have a cool design. It'll give you a lot of different options. You know, it can instead of wearing a watch, you'll have this electronic tattoo. Um, and then she talked about superpowers. You know, it'll give you superpowers. So this is the whole transhumanist agenda. The reason why, um, you know, we've been b bombarded so much lately with superhero movies. Um, to be a superhero, the, the Avengers and X-Men and Thor, you know, Iron Man, all these super so-called superheroes, and you're seeing a a uh, a uh, emergence 
or a merge of mankind with machine in making you a superhuman. So you heard her talking about superpowers, and you heard the audience clapping and cheering, and, you know, people will accept it because it sounds cool. You know, who doesn't want to be more powerful and be a superhero? You know, that's how they're selling it. Also, she had a vitamin um, in, in a chip form, so basically a, a, a metallic chip that when you take it, it's supposed to authenticate with your body. And like she said, that once you take it, then they'll know you've taken it and they'll know everything that's going on in your body. So you've given up your DNA and all of your you know cellular level activities that's going on in your body through taking this this chip form vitamin. And she kept talking about authentication, authentication. Well, the whole main thing of what they're pushing is the fact that it's not convenient to have to go to your phone and type in a code or a password to unlock your phone or to constantly sign in to your bank account or in the Facebook. All these passwords you have to sign in with. Um, go to your car and start your car with a key. Now what they're saying is through this electronic tattoo, everything will be authenticated through this tattoo, that your your hands now become alligator clips. Whatever you touch, authenticates. So you touch your phone, your phone recognizes it's you, and your phone comes alive, and it, it you no longer have to put a password in. Or you touch your computer or your TV or you touch your car. Things just start activating basically off your touch, right? So this is the... This is the convenience and the superpower that they're they're you know uh, promoting to get people to, em to embrace the mark of the beast. This is how they're going to get people to deceive people into taking it because they're not going to come and say, you know, it's mandatory this and you have to take it and, and all. No, they're going to make it so cool. You'll want the mark of the beast. You'll want to take this. This is so great. Look at everything it does. I'm a, you know. Um, I'm now a, a superhuman. I'm now a god. And that's what it's all about is, is man turning into gods. As Genesis 3 um, tells us, when um, the Most High discovers Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, um, and they're told, uh, you know, man has become like us, like gods, to, to, to know both good and evil. So that's Satan's whole, his whole... Uh, you know, uh, his whole strategy of deception is to get you to think that you be, you can become a god. You know, you can evolve past manhood. This is the, the, the philosophy of the Kabbalah. When you look at the tree of, of life of the Kabbalah, it's, it's you, know, it, you know, elevating up the tree into godhood. This is the whole idea of uh, Freemasonry and going from... Um, the first degree up to the 33rd degree, elevating up the tree to supreme knowledge and supreme godhood. Um, climbing the corporate ladder, you start out as just a regular field employee all the way up to the top to CEO. So it's getting you to climb the pyramid to the top where the all-seeing eye is, which we know is, is Lucifer, which is Satan. All right. And then you had uh, another sound bite come on after her speaking about, um, you know, going into the new age, you know, the age where man becomes cyborg and talking about nanotechnology and not a new civilization, but a new mankind. So, again, they're, they're getting you to accept the new age that's coming and to accept this whole idea of you becoming something else than the Most High created you. And that's the reason why the scriptures tell us if you take the mark of the beast, you will receive fire and brimstone before the Lamb. Because once you take this whole technology on, you have now become an abomination as the Most High's creation. You are no longer what he created you as a man. You are now something totally different. You are a whole different type of creation. All right, so now um, let's go into uh, the next article um, because, again, this was uh, this is all all dealing with Google 
and I suggest everybody to do their research on Google and what and what Google is doing um, right now because they're probably uh, one of, if not the biggest, uh, proponents and uh, catalysts of the beast. They're the biggest one right now in operation as far as everything they're doing to bring forth the mark of the beast and the mark of the beast technology from a corporate from a corporate level, from a corporation standpoint. All right. So um off the New York Post dot com it says Google executive plans to live forever. Um October twenty first, twenty thirteen. Google executive plans to live forever. It says here, Google executive Ray Kurzweil takes 100 vitamins a day, the first step in his plan to cheat death. And remember, Regina Dugan was talking about taking that chip vitamin, um, and that would be at your authentication. All right. It says here, the 65-year-old futurist and inventor who is a director of engineering at Google is using a bridge to a bridge, to a bridge system, he says, will enable him to live long enough to see a biotechnology revolution. Because once they sell you on the idea of becoming a god or becoming a greater man or woman, now you're looking at them telling you you can have immortality as a god. Same thing that Eve in the garden. When we know our immortality comes through Christ, it comes through uh, the belief in Christ and following him, we'll receive our immortality. Um, and that's the true immortality. This, what Satan is giving, um, is, is the deception to lead mankind to its destruction. It says here, um, I test myself on a regular basis and it's working, Kurzweil told McLean's. All my measurements are in ideal ranges. I scan my arteries to see if I have plaque buildup and I have no osteoclerosis. I come out younger on biological aging tests. So far, so good. So you see man's desire to be like God, to live forever and to try to cheat death and extend life. To be, the Most High told us in Genesis 6 that he would cut man's life down to 120 for this very evil that had come upon the earth, that the fallen angels had taught mankind this evil and this wickedness, right? So, so we know exactly as the days of Noah, as, as, as Christ told us. It says here, but he says this vitamin program is not designed to last for a long time. The goal is to get to bridge two, the biotechnology revolution can reprogram biology away from disease, Kurzweil said. So, of course, if they sell it to you like this, you'd be like, yeah, let's go for it. You know, no more disease. I don't have to worry about being sick again. It sounds like a good idea to somebody who doesn't understand the, the whole um, framework of what this is all about, the same way with Eve. When when um, Satan told her, you shall not surely die if you eat of this fruit. For the day you eat it, you, your eyes will be open and you'll be like the most high. So this is the same, same thing over and over again, how Satan deceives man. He presents the same, you know, the, the, the same format every time. It doesn't change. He may tweak it a little bit, use different wording, but it's all the same concept. All right, here's the key part. It says bridge three is to go beyond biology to the nanotechnology revolution. Bridge three would see small robots or nanobots augmenting people's immune systems. So their whole goal is to get these chips or these, these metal boards, these, these, these metal robots inside of you that are in control of your body and their, and their cell pitch is that this will prevent disease. These robots in your body will cure you. It says we can create an immune system that recognizes all disease. And if a new disease emerged, it could be reprogrammed to, to deal with new pathogens and see what a lot of people don't understand. And why a lot of people are going to, 
fall into this trap is that the Most High already made our immune system in a way that is the most perfect. Our bodies are the most perfect creation, you know, that there is. We don't need any further um, enhancements. But that, but but again, Satan will lead you down the path to think that these diseases are real, that you must come to them to cure these diseases, and here's the solution. When the Most High gives us understanding on how to deal with disease. It says here, Kurzweil describes human biology as a software process. So now he's comparing the, the biological makeup of a person as a computer program. You and I are walking around with outdated software running in our bodies. So now he's saying that the Most High wasn't perfect in his creation when he created man in his image. Our software, our immune systems are outdated, which evolved in a very different era, he said. We each have a fat insulin receptor gene that says, hold on to every calorie. That was a very good idea 10,000 years ago when you worked all day to get a few calories. There were no refrigerators, so you stored them in your fat cells. I would like to tell my fat insulin receptor gene, you don't need to do that anymore. And he says that extended life would not see people living like a typical 95-year-old for, for hundreds of years. The goal is not just to extend life. The idea is to stay healthy and vital, and not only to have life extension, but life expansion. All right, so you see that? So, again, this is the reason why Paul told us in Colossians 2 and 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Because if man just starts telling you and rattling off philosophy and things that sound good, like, oh, yeah, this sounds good. You know, I'm, I'm obese and, you know, I need to lose weight. And you have a way to do this by putting these, these nanobots in my body and me taking this chip as a vitamin and, you know, taking this electronic tattoo. And, you know, so it sounds good to somebody who's caught up in the image of the beast. So when Revelation 13 tells us them that worship the image of the beast is because they've put up an image of how you should be. This is what you should do. Like the movie, uh, they sleep. Actually, the name of the movie is they live, they live where it's showing you subliminally through advertisements and TV and churches and government, how they are telling you exactly how you should live life. If you're not living life to this degree or level, then you're not living life. If you don't look like this and talk like this and have these things, you're not you're not living life. So this is all part of the image of the beast. And this is what people are going to be willing to put their souls on the line for so that they can maintain this image, so that they can continue to chase after this success in this life that Christ warned us about. So this is the 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 uh, charade and the facade, the the illusion that they put in front of us to chase after, and people are going to uh, they're they're going to sacrifice their souls by taking the mark of the beast to to uphold this. All right, now um, let me see here. Moving on to our next article, I want to see which one I want to go to next. Um, and this is kind of tying into um, the whole surveillance and the mark of the beast, how they're they're putting the, the surveillance processes in place so that they can track you. They can know where you're at. They can keep you from doing this and doing that. Um, this article comes off of freepatriot.org. It says, Oh, back taxes or talk bad about government. No travel for you anymore. And this comes November 5th, 2013. It says, planning on flying anywhere for the holidays. If you owe back taxes, are a frequent flyer, or own a blog that is critical of the government, you might want to read Under the Radar in October, 
the TSA tightened their screening guidelines to include these in their screenings. In fact, they want a full background check. And we talked about the TSA guidelines and, and them putting in place that they'll now be pre-screening people who want to fly in America. All right, so here is going in, this article is going into all the things they're going to be putting in for the pre-screening. And again, this is all the beast control. It wants to control every person and to control you and to bring you into its mark of the beast system. All right, so we can have your soul. It says here, the Transportation Security Agency, TSA, is stepping up its screenings to include even more information into your personal life before you can even board a plane. All right, it says, um, before they will even allow you to travel to your next destination, they are going even further into the warrantless search process and violating the Bill of Rights. While the majority of public in the U.S. will accept this as a routine to prevent terrorism, the new checks may be anything but. The agency is saying that the new goal is to streamline the process and changing the procedures to protect millions of Americans that do not pose a risk to travel. The new measures give the government greater power to use travelers' personal data for part of the domestic airport screenings. They are applying the same measures that are supposed to be used for immigration and customization for people entering the United States. The procedure has been in place but was not activated until recently. The TSA released the screening regulations in order to comply with government requirements. The new regulations put some of the data collection of the National Security Administration scrutiny to shame. As usual, the details of the new provisions were never announced to the public. So they never told the public what was in these provisions, what they were. So what are the things they are looking into? Here is a quick list from TSA and the New York Times. It says here, private information to include who you work for, vehicle registrations, travel history, property ownership records and what property you claim, physical characteristics, tax identification numbers and tax history, past travel itineraries, law enforcement information, intelligence information, the key word list used by the NSA, passport numbers, frequent flyer information, other identifiers linked to DHS databases, including web history and information critical speaking of the government. So you have to ask yourself, how are they getting all this information on you? Well, we just spoke about Google. So a, a, a vast majority of this information that they're gathering on you is they're getting through Google. They're getting the information because most websites are linked through Google. Most of the higher platforms like Facebook and YouTube when you click like on that or you share this or you email that, all of that is being stored in a database to, to, to build a dossier on who you are, you know, what you like, what you're about, all the other government agencies, both state and federal, that can now go through your employment history, your vehicle registration, property, all of that compiled in these massive spy databases. They got a big spy center in um, Utah. They now have these these uh, these new Google barges that they have set up off the coast, like San Francisco, and I believe they have um, one in Maine. But these locations are there as spy hubs to spy on you and to store vast amount of information. They actually even have, I think, in Belgium, the supercomputer called the Beast, which has information on everybody in the world. So they're storing this information digitally, 
about you. And that's the whole reason for Obamacare. They want to get you in the medical database so they can now start gathering medical information about you. Now it's starting to make sense on why Google has developed this chip in a form of a vitamin, and they want you to ingest this vitamin. Because if you'll ingest the vitamin chip, eventually you'll take the chip that goes in your skin. They'll say, well, you know what? Taking 30 of these a day is a bit inconvenient, just like signing in is supposed to be inconvenient when you sign in all the time to these different websites. So now let's make this vitamin situation a little bit more convenient. Let's just go ahead and put this vitamin in your skin, and that way you'll never have to uh, take a vitamin again. We can just link in through the computer, through the Internet, through Wi-Fi. It'll read your body. It'll know what you need, and it'll come through the Internet, and these robots will then start to operate in your body, these nanobots, to fix the problem. This, this is how, this is what the age they're pushing on people. So everything is connected and linked together. All of these things we're talking about all link in together as mark of the beast technology. All right. It says here in this article, reading on, it says, it has gotten so far out of hand that people came to the New York Times to get the information out. I think the best way to look at it as it is a pre-crime assessment every time you fly, said Edward Hasbro, one of the groups that oppose the pre-screening initiatives. The default will be the highest, most intrusive level of search, and anything less will be conditioned on providing some additional information in some fashion. The TSA, which has been criticized for a one-size-fits-all approach to screening travelers, said the initiatives were needed to make the procedure more targeted. Secure Flight has successfully used information provided to airlines to identify and prevent known or suspected terrorists or other individuals on no-fly lists from gaining access to airplanes or secure areas of airports, the security agency said in a statement. Additional risk assessments are used for those higher-risk passengers. An agency official discussed some aspects of the initiative on the condition that she not be identified. She emphasized that the main goal of the program was to identify low-risk travelers for lighter screening at airport security checkpoints, adapting methods similar to those used to flag suspicious people entering the United States. All right, that comes off the New York Times. Now, again, we know that this is the pretext in which they're trying to push this on the population. We understand also that, that it's really designed for a specific demographic of people to keep them from being able to make moves or to move around when the time comes, to limit travel. Because who's to say that anybody couldn't be put on this list and be said, okay, well, we didn't like this about you. We didn't, we didn't like the fact that you worked at such and such employer or job. So you can't travel. You can't go to this place or that place. It's really the powers at their disposal. It's at their discretion on, you know, who can do what. And notice how they've already implemented TSA in the airports to screen you as far as, you know, doing um, all type of, uh, you know, you know, sexual harassment type grope downs at the airport and getting you used to going into these microwave scanners to scan you for any type of, you know, um, terrorist-type uh, material that you may have. Um, all of these things to get you used to the idea that there are terrorists out there, we are not safe, and the government is here to help us. They're here to protect us, and they're going to continue to, to push harder and further. You give them an inch, they take a step. All right, and this is how the beast devours. Um, reading on this article, it says, this brings up several factors that is that this is just wrong. Why are we applying these rules to the normal passenger? Where is the data stored? Why is your property your own? You own their business. 
Are the records even secure? There is already one victim of the tighter security that gets repeatedly searched, even though he has done nothing wrong because their new computer program has flagged him as a potential terrorist. That has happened to Abdullah Dur Dur Durat, an urban planner from Queens, who said he was flagged for extra scrutiny all eight times he flew since June. When he tries to check in online, a message tells him to check in at the airport, where he receives a boarding pass marked with uh, four S's, indicating that he must undergo enhanced screening. His name has been handwritten on a card at the podium where an agent checks passengers' identification, he said. They pat me down, Mr. Durat, 31, said. Then they pull out every single article of of clothing in my bag. They take out every shirt, shirt and every pair of pants. After the checkpoint search, which includes swabbing his luggage to check for explosive residue, he said he was often stopped at the gate before being allowed to fly. He said he assumed that the extra scrutiny was because he had flown to Libya to visit relatives. He also expressed support for protests against Muammar al Gaddafi in 2011. But the extra scrutiny did not happen until this summer. It adds this whole air of suspicion about me to everybody on the plane, he said. So you see how they humiliate you in front of everybody. And, um, and again, this is in the name of so-called terrorism which we know who the real terrorists are. We know that the governments are the real terrorists, and, um, you know, they're putting people through, through the ringer for no reason to promote and bring about their agenda. It says here, it also seems that in some minority report-like fashion, straight from the movies, that the entire process is automated for finding future potential terrorist. At the heart of the expended effort is a database called the Automated Targeting System, which is maintained by the Department of Homeland Security and screens travelers in entering the United States. Data in the Automated Targeting System is used to decide who is placed on the no-fly list. Thousands of people the United States government has banned from flying. And the selectee list, an unknown number of travelers who are required to undergo more in-depth screening, like Mr. Durat. The TSA also maintains a pre-check disqualification list, tracking people accused of violating security regulations, including disputes with checkpoint or airline staff members. Personal data is widely shared within the Department of Homeland Security and with other government agencies. Privacy notices for these databases note that the information may be shared with federal, state, and local authorities, foreign governments, law enforcement, and intelligence agencies, and in some cases, private companies for purposes unrelated to security or travel. So they're sharing your information with everybody, even people that don't have nothing to do with security or travel. Just Give your information to everybody. Everybody needs to know this information. For instance, an update about the TSA's Transportation Security Enforcement Record System, which contains information about travelers accused of violations or potential violations of security regulations, warns that the records may be shared with a debt collection agency for the purpose of debt collection. A recent privacy notice about the pre-check notes that fingerprints submitted by people who apply for the program will be used by the FBI to check its unsolved crimes database. And the New York Times, again, this is where this information is coming from. All right, so again, um, all of this information being used and um, any reason that they have to uh, have an excuse to, to do whatever they want. This is what this is putting in place. Um, and for everybody to know everything about you, you no longer have a personal life. It's, it's the government and all of these agencies' business to know everything about you. Put it all out there. That's, 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 
That's the, the information age that we've come into. It says here, this is unreal. We are labeling potential terrorists, giving the information to third parties, including debt collectors, and violating the Bill of Rights. What happened to freedom from unreasonable search and seizures? Sometimes we wish fiction was not becoming a reality. If people don't speak up about these things, they relatively go unnoticed for years. This is verifiably this is verifiable with the TSA, congressional bills, and the New York Times. This is not their best seller list. This is real. When does the nightmare end? And how deep does the rabbit hole go? All right. Um, so, you know, we talked about in the past uh, uh, the L.A. Uh, shooting that happened at LAX airport. And, and, and that's the reason why they, they make these false flags happen for these types of agendas. So they can further implement, OK, we need more military at the airport or more military like personnel personnel at the airport and you'll say cool you know more protection more security we need more security um got a couple more articles here and then we'll we'll open the call lines to hear what you brothers and sisters have to say about um any of the news or anything that you may have um actually going to read this last article and this comes off of rt.com it says um Newest drone to fly, swim, and drive during missions. November the 11th, 2013. So you ask yourself, okay, does it get any worse? So now they need the means to be able to track you and hunt you down. They have all your information. If you are taking these microchip vitamins or you have the electronic TAC-2, now, through GPS technology and, and things of that nature, they can now track you down with these drones. And um, this particular drone can fly, it can swim, and it can drive. So land, air, and sea drone. It says, uh, move over. Lightweight flying robots. The drone of the future is currently being developed at a government lab. And if all goes as planned, it will do much more than just soar through the sky on its own. While the United States continues to consider the merits behind its overseas weaponized drone program and efforts to allow surveillance, unmanned aerial, ve aerial vehicles sail through domestic airspace, Sandia National Laboratories has released a video showing off a conceptual design meant to make the traditional UAV look like a thing of the past. Sandia's multimodal vehicle concept is still being ironed out, but ideally, scientists hope that they'll be able to soon deploy an unmanned craft capable of flying, swimming, and uh, driving, and even hopping like a frog across any type of terrain or obstacle it may encounter. And you would say, okay, this sounds like straight out of a movie, but these movies are becoming reality right before our very eyes. Independently, a number of autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles are already capable of seemingly everything under the sun. If this latest endeavor works out accordingly, however, Sandia will have its hands on a small vessel capable of traversing air, land, and water. That means a single drone could be launched from a random station, soar through the sky on its own, only to land in a river, navigate to another location, and then pick itself up out of the water and walk to a site where it could collect intelligence. After all, of drones currently included in the American military's arsenal involved unmanned craft that can kill a target from thousands of feet away, snoop on suspects using infrared cameras, or sniff chemicals, using state-of-the-art sensors. The laboratory says its intelligent systems, robotics, and cybernetics office has been slaving over 
a way to combine the different types of drones currently available in order to perfect this multimodal vehicle concept. And they've already built and conducted testing on conceptual design to try and hammer out the kinks needed to produce a fully functioning craft capable of doing more on its own than the average human. It says here, imagine a mission where you have to covertly fly into an area, traverse through water, cross land, and overcome obstacles along the way. Sandia says on its website, ISRC has built the limited testing on conceptual hardware, and while the concept may appear to be off in the distant future, our testing has shown that this concept could soon be a reality. The real value added of the multimodal vehicle is that it allows maximum flexibility in highly complex missions without the concern over whether or not all of the vehicles are positioned just right. John Salton, a Sandia engineer working on the project, told Wired. All right, so this is the technology and the tools and toys that the beast has at its disposal because we know that they're about 50 years, if not more, um, advanced in technology than what they show or tell us. The reason why a lot of the movies that are, you know, that were made in the 80s and 90s um, seem so realistic today as being reality. They're not, you know, RoboCop and Terminator. All of those movies are reality today. You know, Iron Man, you know, they have these particular type of, uh, you know, weapons and hardware at the disposal now because they had the prototypes and and, and probably a lot of that already uh, on hand then. So this is the whole purpose is that you'll, you'll not be able to travel um, if you're not worshiping the image of the beast. You're not going to be able to hide if you're not worshiping the image of the beast and taking its mark because now they got drones that can go in the water, they can fly, they can a, a transformer, so to speak, you know, you know, growing up watching the cartoon Transformers, you know, it was just a cartoon, but now you see these transforming drones like, man, you know, this drone can do almost everything. And because Americans have allowed the drone program to expand overseas, in Pakistan and other Middle Eastern countries, they have not, you know, people are getting killed, innocent people are getting killed every day over drones. Americans could care less as long as it's not them. But the whole point of the matter is, is that when you stand by and don't speak on those things, especially when it's coming by your tax paying dollars, eventually it's going to come back on your own head. So that's the reason why by 2015, that they are expected to have 30,000 drones in American skies. Um, and and they're, they're ramping up these drone programs because American people are just, you know, just standing on the sidelines. Not, you know, most don't know or aren't informed on any of this. But those that do, majority of them don't care, could care less. You know, they got other things to worry about. They got their own life to worry about and live for. So, for Americans, until it happens to you, till it hits your front door, they're not going to care. They're not going to do anything about any of this. And when they want to act and do something, it's going to be too late. So for us that understand and know these things, it's our job that we be proactive and not reactive to what's going on. That we see what's going on in the world around us. That should make us cleave to the Most High a hundred times more. That we should want to get into scriptures and say, okay, what is it I need to do to be righteous, to survive in these times? What is it I need to do because tomorrow's not promised? Even though a lot of these things aren't happening to the highest level right now, that we are still operating with some sort of liberty and the beast hasn't just completely devoured it. It's still, you know, you know, trotting at a, at a, at a you know, constant pace. Um you know, tomorrow's not promised. So we should be wanting to do everything we can 
to understand what we need to do to be righteous, to understand what's going on, to have wisdom, to say, okay, this is what I need to do. I know I don't need to be here in this place, whatever place the Most High is saying he's going to bring destruction to. I need to be warning people I know. Every chance I get, I need to be letting people know um, what's going on, um, that they need to repent you know, uh, of their wicked ways, to follow Christ, um, keep the commandments. You know, this should be our focus because we are the witnesses. We are the two witnesses the scriptures speak about in the book of Revelation. And it's our job to witness to the world, you know, in these times. The prophets wrote about all of these things that are going to happen and that are happening. And they they long to have lived to see the visions happen in real time. And they and they, they long to be here right now to see it and to see the end. And we have the opportunity to be here to see what's going to be the greatest, the most high said it's going to be greater than the creation as far as what's going to happen in this earth in these days and how he's going to save that remnant. So, um, you know, again, it, it does sound frightening to a degree, all the things that are happening and going on. But, you know, we are not to have any fear, but for the most high. So it's no reason to fear any of these things, but it, that doesn't mean to just continue to live life like everything's normal or to continue to live your life in this world and try to make a, a name or a a uh, habitation in this life. All right, we need to deny ourselves and pick up our cross knowing that we will be persecuted. We will be tried as gold is tried through the fire. We will go through tribulation, and we have been going through tribulation. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. 